chance. Amen. Matter of fact, I think every day I need another chance, but amen. But we're going to uh, get into this word, and I hope it all makes sense. It, it kind of wrestled with this one a little more than average, and so I'm going to try to tie it together. How many of you know, sometimes God gives you these thoughts, and give you this thought, and this thought, and this thought, and they don't naturally just all flow together, so i got to somehow get them to all flow together and make sense today, and I pray that they will do that for you because this message is all about glorifying God and being a blessing to you. I want you to leave here filled with his joy, his peace, and having the word to encourage you and to give you the strength you need to live a successful, godly, overcoming, devil-stomping, amen, victorious life in Jesus. And so, amen. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation today. And this is what it says, and this is speaking of Moses uh, at the time when God called him up the second time up to the mountain. And it says, at that time, the Lord said to me, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. Also make a wooden ark, a sacred chest to store them in. Come up to me on the mountain. What a blessing when God invites us to come up to the mountain with him. And I will write on the tablets the same words that were on the ones that you smashed. Then place the tablets in the ark. The God of another chance. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you today and I just want to pause right now and express my love and my adoration to you. Lord, we're here as your people, sitting, standing before you. And Lord, we need some manna from heaven today. We, we ask that your Holy Spirit would bring life, would bring encouragement. Father, give this servant of yours liberty to preach, anoint these lips of clay, and let our hearts, Father, be receptive today. Let the word go past our ears, past our heads, and down into our hearts today. Lord, and let us be encouraged. And the church agreed by saying, Amen. Amen. Today we're going to talk about the God of another chance. I am so, th Juliet, we love you. Let her know one more time we appreciate her. Amen. I'm so glad that God gives us another chance. I've seen God time and time and time again give people another opportunity, another chance to get up and to move forward. And I remember a, a couple of parents that they had this idea on how to help their children remember to do what they were supposed to do, and it was called a chancy board. And what they did is they wrote down each child's name and all the chores they were supposed to do. And, and if they did their chores, it was all good. But if they didn't do their chore or they messed up on a chore, how many of you know what they got? They got a chancy. And that was all good. But if you got three chancies, guess what? You didn't get your allowance. And if you got the fourth chancy, watch out. You hear the word that every teen fears most. You're grounded. Amen. And so these, these chancy boards, what they did is they gave those children another opportunity to get it right, another opportunity uh, to do better. And so in this Deuteronomy, if you will, Moses is going over the laws and the responsibilities that God had given to them. Now, these weren't new laws, they weren't, weren't new responsibilities. Deuteronomy actually means the second law. So they had already heard all these sermons, and what they were getting, if you will, was a reminder, if you will. And, and so uh, here's the context. Moses is about to die, and he's going to go to be with the Lord. And the children of Israel are about ready to get a new leader named Joshua. And they're going to go into the promised land. They're going to inhabit the promised land that God has promised to them. And so Moses, being the good uh, uh, pastor that he is, he gives them a reminder sermon. How many of you know sometimes pastor needs to preach the same things a few times until we get it down? Amen. And don't get mad at the pastor. I've heard you preach that before. Well, are you living what I preached before? Amen. 
And sometimes we got to keep hearing it and hearing it until we learn to start living it. Amen. How, how many of you know living it's a process? And so uh, Moses reminds them, and what he's, what he's doing is he's, he's giving them some of his last instructions, and he reminds them, do you remember when God called me up to the mountaintop? And I went up there, and I was with God, and I was there for 40 days. And do you remember what you all did? And he says, I want to remind you, you made a golden calf, and you worshipped it. You did this even though you saw the mighty miracles that I displayed when I brought you and delivered you out of Egypt. Not only that, but I fed you with manna every day. You saw my power when the manna showed up. Amen. You didn't get that manna out of a Cracker Jack box, amen. God says, I gave you that manna. And, and, and God says, and I had a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and I led you so intricately through that wilderness. And so what God says is that I gave you evidence that I was powerful, that I delivered you, and I gave you evidence that I was with you every day. Yet as soon as I took a little break and went up to the mountaintop, you went right back to doing the same to doing the same things that you used to do. Amen. You went right back, amen, you made a golden calf and you started worshiping that golden calf. Now, Moses comes down from the mountaintop, and when he was there, God gave him these two tablets made out of stone, and God himself had written on those tablets, I, I, I believe they were the Ten Commandments, at least that's what you would think when, you know, you see all the little images, and, but it was the commandments of God, and he comes down, and when Moses looks and sees them, partying and carrying on and worshiping a golden calf, he gets so frustrated he throws the tablets down and smashes them. He goes over, gets the golden calf, grinds it up and throws it away. And, and he comes back now and, and sees that God was so angry over their rebellion, over the golden calf and over all that God had done for them. And God finally says, I just don't see any hope in this group of people. I'm going to give up on them. They're going to die in the wilderness. But Moses, he has a whole different outlook. And Moses begins to be a great intercessor. And he begins to, how many of you know prayer works? Amen. And, and, and he prays and he intercedes and says, God even comes to this point. I mean, he's serious. He says, God Listen, if you're going if to, you, if you let something happen to them, they're going to say they died out here because you didn't have the power to get them all the way to the promised land. How many of you know sometimes God wants to know why we want what we want and why we want him to do what we want him to do? And, and, and he says, but God, and I think this is the clincher, God, if you're going to let them die, then take my life, God. And when Moses said that, God heard his cry, and God says, all right, I'm going to give them another chance. Amen. Thank God that somebody has prayed for us. Thank God that God has given us another chance. I don't know about you, but I should have died several times when I was out there living in my junk. But thank God he set me free. Yes, he set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. And so Moses interceded for them. And what I want us to think about is this, is that if Moses interceded for them, and God saved them because of Moses' Moses's intercession and prayers, he stood in the gap. What I want us to think about is that Moses here is a type of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that if God saved them because Moses interceded, how much more is God going to save us, deliver us, and help us because we have the great intercessor of all time. Amen. Jesus didn't just say, I'm going to intercede for you. No, I'm getting excited. i got to slow down. No, he said, I came down and I died on the cross for you. I shed my blood for you. I, I took those stripes on my back for you. And, and, and I did all of this for you. And then after they crucified me, they buried me in the tomb. But he only needed it for a weekend, amen. <laughs> because he rose again on the third day. 
and he's alive forevermore. And you know what the scriptures say? He's alive and where he's at and what he's doing. He's at the right hand of the Father. And it says he ever lives to make intercession for you and for me. Right now he is interceding and praying for you. He's pleading with the Father to bring God's grace, God's favor, God's blessing even more upon your life. He's interceding for all of us. But with this wonderful grace we receive comes some responsibilities. I knew you'd get to that point, Pastor. Amen. We must never forget that Jesus paid a very high price for this grace that we enjoy. So God has Moses preach a powerful sermon to remind them again what they needed to do with this grace. God doesn't just say, well, I, you're forgiven, that's okay. Just go out and keep doing what you've been doing. Just go on out there and keep worshiping that golden calf and keep living the same old way. No, God never, ever does that. God, if you will, gives us another chance so we can get up, become stronger, become better, amen, and move forward and live in victory and overcome those areas in our lives that hold us back, that frustrate us. And I declare today in the name of the Lord, they're coming down just like Goliath came down. They are coming down in Jesus' name. He gives them another chance, so... To put it in the context, Moses goes up on the mountain. 40 days, God gives him stone tablets with his own <laughs> writing on them. He comes down, he sees them. They're worshiping the golden calf. He smashes the stones, destroys the golden calf. God saves them because Moses interceded for them. Now, I want you to catch this. Look what God did right after that. And this is point one. God calls them right back to his word. And today God is calling his church back to his word. The first thing God does is he calls Moses straight back up to the mountaintop and he gives him another set of his word or his commandments and he gives them to him. God says, bring two stone tablets with you and, and, and when you come up uh, the second time, I'm going to give you just what I gave you the first time. How many of you know God doesn't have to give us a bunch of new stuff? He just needs to remind us so we can live some of the old stuff. And he, and, and he makes a, 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 a commandment, bring up these stone tablets. And when he gets up there, it says that God himself, it says the finger of God, and I love this, the finger of God wrote the commandments back into the stone tablets. And what this tells me is that when God himself, with his own finger, rewrote those commandments, what this does is it, is it emphasizes the priority that God places on his word. He didn't have somebody else write them down with his own finger. And what God's doing here is he's emphasizing that it is my will, it is my decree, that back then and through every generation and every group of people that will ever serve the Lord, I'm going to call them back to my word, amen, and to understand my word is life. My word will transform us. My word, says the Lord, will make a difference in our lives. And then he engraves it in stone, and stone representing permanency. It means, in other words, this is for every generation. It's for every child of God. It's for every, it's not just for the pastors. It's not just for the leaders. No, every child of God needs to come back to the word of God and get a hold of what God is saying to us and speaking to us. We are, if you will, to study this word. We are to love this word. We are to read this word. We are to obey this word. We are to share this word. We are to speak this word. This word here is life transforming. It is the ever living powerful word of of the Almighty God. And God calls us back to His Word. And so as Moses nears the end of his life, he, he, he emphasizes so much the Word of the Lord. 
And in Deuteronomy 28, you've, you've read it, I'm sure it's, it's, it's the chapter of blessing and curses depending on what we do with the word. And he says, if you will make my word, if you will make this book, the word of God, your highest priority in your life, this is what God promises he will do. He says he will bless you. He will bless your children. Listen to this. I will set you on high. God says, I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to uh, promote you. I'm going to cause you to do better. And I'm going to bless you above all the nations of the world. And then he says that your children... Nothing compares. We want so much for our children to do well. We want so much for our children to be blessed, to be healthy, to be successful. And we do all these things to make that happen. But God says, if you will make my word the priority of your life, he says, I will bless you. Who ever thought that that's one of the best ways to see our children blessed is by us making God's word the highest priority in our life. He says, I will bless your children. And then he says, I will bless your, it says your crops. We don't grow crops, most of us. If you have a garden, I love tomatoes. No, amen. <laughs> Actually, I like squash better. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> and anyways, you know them big old fat ones that they grow? No. <laughs> and... and at least I'm using illustrations about vegetables now, not tri-tip, amen. you got to give, give me a break, amen. And, uh, and where was I at? And, and, and so he says your children will be blessed. Then he says your crops means our work, that's our careers, our jobs, our business. It's going to be blessed by Almighty God. And then he goes on to say... The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do. If you will obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you. This is good news because we're people of the word. You're here today because you want to hear the word. You want more of God's word. And we should start looking for the blessing. We should start believing that God's word is true and that God is going to bless our children. He's going to bless our homes. He's going to bless us. And that God is going to transform our lives. And then Moses closes out the sermon and he says, Now listen, today I'm giving you a choice. And it's all based on this, between life and death, prosperity and disaster. He says, I'm giving you a choice. If you will... I command you this day to love the Lord your God and keep his commandments, degrees, and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply. God's just another way of saying you're going to be doubly blessed. Now, I probably don't have time to preach all this, but up next, after Moses, God uses a guy by the name of Joshua. Now Joshua takes over, and he's, and he's scared to death. He's, for 30 days, he's depressed and discouraged because there's no way he can fill Moses' shoes. Finally, after 30 days, God comes down and gives him Joshua chapter 1 and tries to encourage him. Boy, you got to get up and get going. we gotta, we got an agenda here. And, and, and this is what God says him, to go in and to conquer 31 nations greater and mightier than yourselves. This is what you've got to do. He says it's all going to be based on what you do with this word. He tells Joshua the same thing he told Mo Moses, but in a different way. He says, listen, first of all, this is my word. And if you want to be successful, he says, don't turn to the right or to the left of my word. In other words, here's the word right here. In other words, keep it right here. Don't turn to the right and start going this way. Stay right here. Stay with the word. And don't go to the left and start going this way. What he's saying is don't put any distance between you and my word. Fight for my word. Keep my word daily in your life. You have to fight for the word. The enemy hates this word. He hates it. Every time you sit down and watch a TV show, you never get interrupted. But the minute you say, I'm going to sit down and read my word tonight, everything that can go wrong goes wrong. The kids get sick, the husband's mad, the dog bit the cat, and just everything turns upside down. So he says, don't turn to the right or to the left. And this is what he says. And he says, meditate in my book day and night. This, this kind of gets me. You know why? Because 
he's got two to three million people he's, he's leading. You think you got a busy schedule? This guy was, had everything pulling on him that could pull on him. And, and, and God says, this is how you're going to be successful. You're going to meditate in my book day and night. And my friends, I'm telling you, right here is the battle. How can I be, 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 uh, receive more and, and be a benefited pastor more by the word of God? Do I need to read for two hours? No, 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 no. Do I need to do something different with a different lighting, read it in a different room? I, uh, no, 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 no. Here's the secret. Meditate. It means to be able to free your mind of the agitation, of the stress. I don't know about you, but when I sit down, sometimes it takes me a half hour just for my mind to slow down so I can focus. And what he's saying, it's not the amount of time, it, it, it's not where you do it, but we have to fight to be able to meditate on it. And the only way you can meditate, it means to, to chew on it, to think it over. And the only way we can do that is if we can find a way each day to shut out all the noise. See, it's not what's out there that's going to get us. It's what we let get inside of us. And we're trying to read the word, and we're mad because that numbskull driver just, you know, where'd they get their license? And we're all shook up. Or, or we argue about who left the milk out at home. I went to get milk, and it was warm. Who left it on the counter again? I've asked you a hundred times. Not to, come on. And we get all worked, and we go to read our word, we're all worked up. Or we're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. We're gonna, we worry about something that we have no control over. And what happens, we read the word. But I, I took speed reading in, in Bible college. Guess what? Meditating on the word is not speed reading through the word. It means slow down. Think about what you're reading. And chew on it. In other words, this is the battle of every Christian. What can I do to calm my mind and calm my spirit? Because that's the only way you can really meditate on the word is if you have a calm mind and a calm spirit. And that's why the enemy fights us so hard to keep us worked up, agitated, stressed out. You know it all. That's why we go out and fish all day and catch no fish. He doesn't want us to come home and rejoice and read the word. Amen. Larry, that's a good place for you to say amen. amen. So he says to meditate in the word day and night. And he says to observe the word. And, and, and this means to watch carefully. So when we're reading the word, what we're doing, we're asking questions. We're looking. Naomi cracked me up. She did a little Bible study yesterday. And she was asking me some questions the night before. And... And she did you ever see this, that these two blind men, they, they followed Jesus out of the temple, and they cried out, hey, Jesus, have mercy on me. And, and I said, yeah, I think I've read that before, but it's not one of the blind stories you really are that familiar, because you don't, you don't preach that one. That one doesn't have as good preaching material as all the other ones. And, and, and she says that, and I said, say that again. She says, two blind men followed Jesus, and they started to cry out to Jesus. And, I, and we both sat there and said, wait a minute. How did two blind men follow Jesus if they were blind? How does that happen? But that's an example of you ask questions. In other words, you observe it. And what it means is to look at something, how something's done, or what happened there, and try to learn from it. So try to learn from the life experience. It's a lot better to learn from the mistakes someone else made than the mistakes we're about to make. Learn from the life experiences. Learn from it. Observe it. But we observe it, he says, to do it. He says, observe to do. And, and, and so, I'll be honest with you. This is the harder part right here. Because it's so easy to read. Oh, man, what a blessing. I get goosebumps. I'm inspired to hear the pastor preach. Yes, that's so good. Praise God. But you know what? That's the easiest part almost, except for... Calm in our mind and spirit. That's tough now. But now we move into the hard part, and that is doing the work it takes to let the word mold us and shape us 
And for us not to conform our lives to something else, but to conform our lives to what we learned and saw when we were in the scripture or heard the preaching or, or whatever. And, and, and the Bible says, you've, you've all heard this, right? But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. We all like that. We know that, right? But you know the verse right beneath it? You know what it says? It, it, well, let me go back. It says, and deceive not yourselves, being here only not a doer. What that means, deceive, I looked up that word, it means to cheat yourselves. In other words, every time you read a word and you take it and you begin to apply it, God has a blessing waiting for you. Every single time you, you chip away itself and do a little bit more what his words, God has a blessing. So when we hear the word and don't do it, we're cheating ourselves out of some blessing God has in store for us. And, and it, you might be praying over here for something completely different, and you over here and you do something completely different over here, but this can affect what happens over there. You just don't know how God's going to bless you, but he will. And, and, and so what happens is says, but be a doer, that verse right underneath it says, not only to be a doer of the word, but it says that he that's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. Did you know that? He, he, he implies and ties in that doing the word of God is work. In other words, it's an assignment. In other words, when we get the word of God, it's like God also gives us a homework assignment. Now go and apply this. Go and let this do something in your life try to make this conform to your life and or your life conform to that and so observe to do that's the harder part it, it, calming our mind and spirit and now actually putting it to work and 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 but what he says that our success in life will de be determined upon that and now Moses he shows them what is next okay so here I am right he he's given the word a second time I say yes Lord I love your word and so I'm going to make your word the priority of my life now what's going to happen next listen to what Moses tells them we need to experience the power that is in God's word for ourselves you don't need to hear pastor tell you how powerful I mean you do need to hear that but each of us need to experience the power of the word of God in our own lives you know what it says in the book of Hebrews it says this for the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Wait a minute, did you hear that? I don't know about you, but I don't always feel alive and powerful. I don't. Sometimes I feel pretty weak. But this is alive and powerful. What's going to happen if I put something that's alive and powerful inside of me? Then I'm going to experience the power of God's word in my life. And God says, we need, so what, what he goes on and he says this, he says, but what, it's just a little bit past this from, but what does the Lord re require of you? So now that you've made the word the priority and you're going to put the word in you, now you're going to have the power to live out the requirements that God has for your life. You aren't strong enough yourself to be a good Christian. You're not strong enough yourself to live a life that pleases God. You need the power of God's word inside of you to live that kind of a life. He says, this is a question we should ask. What does the Lord require of you? That's what he says. One is to reverence the Lord, to fear the Lord. In other words, God, you're, you're awesome, you're mighty. Can I share something I read the, yesterday or the day before? Talking about how the word helps us to reverence God. I read about Hezekiah. And, and Hezekiah was sick and he was going to die, right? And so what happens is he cries, oh God, you know I've served you. You know I've been faithful. I've done what I can. And so God sends the prophet back and says, okay, chill out. I've added 15 years to your life. But then he says to the prophet, well, how do I know what you're saying is from the Lord? How do I know this is true? He says, do you want the sun to go forward 10 degrees or back 10 degrees? And he says, the sun always goes forward. Let's, if this is God, let's have it go back. So I did some Mr. Google stuff. And I, and I read up, you know that the, the planet we're flying around in space on right now, we're traveling at 67,000, if this is the sun, we're traveling around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. And as we travel around the sun at that speed, we are spinning this way also at another 1,000 miles per hour. And I thought, what if man tried to make the sun go back? You know what man would have to do? What would he do? Put a 
couple big telephone poles out of pure steel in each axis of the earth, get a couple jet, not jets, rocket launchers and, and with high thrust and try to latch on and make, because not only do you have to make it, you first have to stop the momentum of this big planet spinning at a thousand miles an hour. And then after you spin it, then, then it went back right away. So then you got to make it go backwards <laughs> at least probably 10, because it was, uh, what, 10 times that speed? Make it go backwards? I read that, and I said to myself, man, we serve an... Uh, Hezekiah, I don't think he understood all the stuff, how the earth travels, but we do. Let me tell you, if he can do that, he can heal you, man. He can do that, he can restore you. And, 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 and so when you read the word, it helps you, because God requires you to reverence him and put him in a category all by himself. Oh, I love that preaching right there. And, and, and fear the Lord. And, and then he says to love the Lord. Man, when I get into Psalms 103, it says, I'm going to bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of my sins, who heals all my diseases, and who redeems my life from destruction. When I think about what God's forgiven me from, when I think about how God has healed me, when I think about how God has gotten me out of trouble, has God ever got any of you out of some trouble? Amen. Time and time, and he keeps getting me out of trouble. Just ask my wife, amen. And it, it makes it easy to love him and then to serve him. Amen. God's requirement is that we serve him, that we please him. And so when I read Hebrews eleven six, 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. And those who come to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Then I understand if I diligently seek him, he's going to reward me and he's going to bless me. So the word, not only should it be my highest priority, but when I get it into me, it's going to give me power to live the life that God requires me to live. Because I can't live that life on my own. And, and when we are not in this word, let me tell you what happens. This swimming pool I had, the pump went out on it. You ever seen a built-in pool when the filter and the pump stop working correctly? It got a little green, nothing to worry about. Then another week goes by. Man, it's getting a little shade, not darker shade of green. After three weeks, it was real green. Then like after about two months, it was almost black. I had to replaster the whole pool. What a dummy I was. How many of you know it talks about the washing of water by the word of God? And when we get into this book, it washes. It's like being hooked up. If we're not in this word, we're like the swimming pool with no filter turned on. And we go darker and darker. But, but when we get in this, it has a supernatural cleansing effect. That t If you want to be a grump, just quit reading your word. Amen. You want to be happy? Start putting more of this in your life. Because when you do it, it cleanses you. It takes that jerk at work. You know who I'm talking about. The one that gave you a bad hair day. Guess what? Get in this word. Man, he's the nicest guy I ever met. Amen. It changes our whole perspective. But, but it supernaturally washes the, the spiritual dirt. So you don't have to go out and do something dirty to get dirty. You just are in this world, man. You're around numbskulls all day. You're around problems that come your way. You face challenges all day long. And, and, and we don't have to do anything bad or anything wrong to, to need cleansing by the word of God. So, so I, I, that's, that's probably a, enough on that. And so now we've talked about the word being our highest priority. We talked about how it empowers us to live a victorious life. And now he goes on to say this. He says, I don't need these. Anyways, he says, he says, when you go in to the promised land, this is what he says, make sure you don't ask them how do they worship the gods that they're worshiping. Don't ask them how they're worshiping their gods. In other words, the word of God 
is what's going to protect us from becoming and getting from being influenced by ungodly influences and worldly influences. Let me put it to you this way. God brought them out of Egypt. Everybody say, out of Egypt. Spent 40 years taking Egypt out of them. And now they're going to go into a whole other culture, a whole other set of, of people with different customs. And God says, okay, if you're going to go in there, these guys are idolaters. They do wicked stuff. They're bad people. Some even sacrifice their own kids to these gods. You need to make this your highest priority. So when you get into this new promised land here, that these people don't influence you and you then become a mixture of what I've made you during these 40 years in the wilderness and what's going on there. In other words, God says, I want you to keep your life and your worship to me pure. I don't want your life and your worship to me to be a mixture of what I want and what the world's doing. A mixture of what I want. Go ahead, give them a hand clap of praise. A mixture of what I want. And a mixture of what your neighbors are doing. A mixture of what I want and the way they do it in Santa Cruz. No. I want my word. Amen. In other words, our lives to be protected from all the influences around us that God is not pleased with. We need to make this word our highest priority. And it will keep us and guard us. Amen. From the influence of this world, from the ungodliness of this world. That's good preaching, Pastor. That, that, that's just downright good preaching there. We need, to, we need to, to make the word the highest priority of our lives. And as we do, you know, you know what? When I, <laughs> I'm in the word and I'll be around and go somewhere. And you just, li you just listen to people. And what happens is, this is what he told Joshua. He says, and this word shall not depart out of your mouth. In other words, you need to speak this word. Yeah. And so I'm not like, Polly want a cracker? Polly want a cracker? Jesus says this, Jesus. No, I don't go around just speaking the word everywhere. But when I'm around and I listen to people or there's a situation that comes up, man, automatically it gets filtered through what this book says. And, we, and so I don't always say, but if someone asks me something, I won't say, well, God says in John 14, 7 that you should, no. I just say, well, you know, you, maybe you should try this, maybe you should try. But guess what? Indirectly, it's seasoned by the word of God. And, and so God wants our relationship with this book to be so much that we get it in us, that even though we don't go around like Polly want a cracker Christian, you know, robo Christian, repent, brother. Get saved, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. No. No. Just be you. Be you, but be seasoned by this word. Let your, your speech always be with grace. Seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt. And, and what happens is, is all of a sudden, when I started reading the Bible uh, and really getting into it and learning it, the first time I really was like, spent like 40 hours a week just reading this thing. Just in love with God's word. And, and everything I would see, uh, scripture would come to my mind. Oh, oh, this, oh, oh, this, oh, that. Oh. And, and can I tell you that God wants us to, not to be Polly want a cracker, have to quote scripture, know every scripture. But at least when we see things we can discern, is this something God... It's pleased with because a lot of stuff's gray a lot of stuff's not black and white God doesn't forbid but but if we know enough of the word and enough of God it will season us to know how to speak the right things how to make the right decisions let's give the Lord a big hand clap of praise amen would you stand with me today with let's bow our heads and let's let's close our service in prayer and uh Lord, we thank you so much. God, I pray this word will have helped us, will have encouraged us. And Lord, I pray you would help me as the pastor of this church to read the word more, to get more into the word, not just for a message, but just for me, Lord. And help your people today, God, 
in relationship to your word. I just pray, Lord, you would let this message put a deep hunger in us. God, to want to read our word, to want to have more of your word. Lord, maybe we'd even switch the channel, listen to preaching on the car, whatever. God, just I pray the Holy Spirit, you would use this word to bring this to our remembrance this week and let us say yes to your word this week. And God, help us to, to, to see that we are a blessed people. God, that if we will make your word, and God, most people here are making your word their priority. So I'm asking now that you would open heaven, that you would start chasing them down with blessings. You would start flowing into their lives with abundance. Let them see the hand of God in such a way they cannot deny that it's you. And that you would open heaven on each person under the sound of my voice. And Lord, I pray that you would just let us all say yes to you. You see the first part with your heads bowed just for a moment of saying yes to God. It's saying yes to his word where he says that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means you've sinned, I've sinned. We, we're all sinners. And it says the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. I didn't come to give you bad news. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And today God offers you the gift of eternal life. And that comes by believing in Jesus and asking him into your life to be your Lord and Savior. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, my life is not where it needs to be with God. I, I need to dedicate my life to Christ today. Will you pray for me, Pastor? If that's you, would you just lift your hand up, please? Lift your hand up. Please lift up your hands. Thank you for your honesty today. I believe today there's some that want to say yes to the Lord. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead us in a prayer of dedication to Jesus. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask us all to spend a little time in prayer and ask God to help us to put more of God's word into our hearts and into our lives. If you want to say this prayer and dedicate your life to Christ, say this with me, church, help me. Dear Jesus, I give my life to you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Give me strength to live for you. Help me to make your word a high priority in my life. Now I'm going to invite you just to spend some time in prayer. Those of you that would like prayer, we have some altar workers that will be down here in the front on the right side. My right, your left. If you just want to pray by yourself.